no necesita. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, that panel uh, did an awesome job of setting the stage for this one uh, with the history of, of different security and, and wallet solutions and then talking a little bit about what the usability looks like today and what those main uh, security and usability challenges are uh, today. So we have the opportunity to talk with some uh, people who represent a number of the leading wallets in the space about what the wallets of tomorrow look like and the things they're doing to simplify uh, and improve both the security and the user experience. So let's get started here and I'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Federico Bond. I'm one of the developers uh, behind Moon. Uh, Moon is a pretty new wallet. Uh, we have launched globally in October uh, and we have seen a very steady growth in users. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been doing differently from other wallets at, at Moon, uh, and you will notice right when you open the app, is that you don't see like a big balance number or some kind of portfolio management thing. Uh, what you'll see is a list of your, of your friends and your contacts. So we are very focused on peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, and also enabling this use case to work over the Lightning Network. That's what I'm working on full time. Uh, so we're kind of trying to move directly from uh, the state of the, the wallets today with on-chain payments uh, to a future of automatic channel management where you're using the Lightning Network, but you don't even know it's there. It works seamlessly. Um, we also have a very uh, heavy focus on on user experience and usability for end users. Hello everyone, my name is Paul Poy. I'm CEO and co-founder of Edge, uh, formerly Airbits. We built a mobile wallet for originally for Bitcoin and now we've expanded with Edge into multiple assets, Ethereum, Monero, Ripple, Stellar, ERC20 tokens, and it's a mobile wallet that also lets you buy, sell, trade crypto inside of the app. Our biggest differentiator between many of the other options is exactly what they were describing in the uh, previous panel, which is key management. So we take a single key and make that key automatically encrypted and backed up on your device and into the cloud so you never have to see or write down um, a private seed, 24 words. You know, that happens automatically for you. Um, and we believe in the future, though, with what they had mentioned with multisig, can still leverage this type of single key management. Um, so I invite you guys to try it. We have a booth here as well. Talk to our staff and see if you have any questions if you haven't already tried Edge. Hi everyone, my name is Bach Nguyen and I started off as a marketing manager at Satoshi Labs, the makers of Trezor, and I'm working with the business development team, working on technical uh, integration with various uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency services. Uh, you might know the Trezor uh, as the first cryptocurrency hardware wallet. Uh, we're actually celebrating uh, five years of the company and seven years of the um, wallet concept this year. And well, when it comes to usability or the future of security, um, we are focusing mainly on user experience right now because security is very important, but it's not very worth much if you can't use it well, if a normal person can't use it well. And I want to jump in on that user experience point. Let's talk a little bit about what would the, the user experience of the future look like? If we're, if we're talking a couple years out, if we're talking abstracting away a lot of the complexity that, that early cryptocurrency adopters are, are used to today, what do you think that looks like? Yeah, I, I think definitely it's a move like away from just directly modeling the, the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, so... Um, Probably a lot of a lot of the things that, that we see today are a result of thinking from the technology uh, to the use cases. When what we should be doing is working backwards from the use case back to what kind of technologies can support those use cases, uh, making sure that crypto works for uh, the average user that that doesn't want to learn or spend years learning how to properly do key management. Of course, uh, uh, it requires a relearning of, of a lot of things, uh, but we want to make that transition very, very easy for, for end users. And, and if you think about the, the analogy with browsers, we are at the point where maybe to, uh, to use a web page, you would have to type like the IP address or, 
or do a manual DNS lookup, copy the result, put it into a browser, download assets manually, compiling the web page just to see something. Uh, and to get from there to something that, that, that works everywhere like a modern web browser, uh, it requires creative thinking around uh, some of the crypto uh, limitations or self-imposed limitations. So it's interesting we use this word wallets. And in the world of crypto, really only two things are ever required is wallets and mining. But wallets really are every different way to interface with a blockchain. So what I think the future of user experience is going to look like is that you're going to have wallets which are really very targeted applications for a specific use case. So just like Moon is trying to build a wallet that is very specific to kind of peer-to-peer -peer you, your friend payment, kind of like the Venmo of wallets. Today we still see a lot of wallets also that are very portfolio oriented. Soon you'll see wallets that are going to be very e-commerce oriented. Um, all of the dApps that are getting built today are a layer on top of our decentralized money and they are the financial services layer but all of them are effectively in and of themselves a piece of a wallet. It's just a different way to talk to a blockchain. Basic wallets send and receive, more complicated ones do loans and insurance. So what I think you're gonna see is very, very targeted use case for all of these wallets because all of them interface with a blockchain. They all have to talk with private keys, but we're gonna have a huge variety of how we want to interface with them, both at a personal level and also at a purpose level. And so that variety is what I think we're going to see going forward and the user experience being very driven to each of those use cases. Um, well, we at Satoshi Labs, we've been focusing on the user interface in general of the Trezor wallet. i um, not talking about the hardware right now because there's very much of a limitation what you can do with a small screen. I'm talking about the web wallet interface. Um, if some of you remember, the first web wallet interface was very Spartan. There was not much to see there. Um, and we have taken a lot of effort into making it graphically more appealing. Um, the next step we're doing is uh, we are removing all the elements that might create user confusion. We don't want a user that comes to the wallet, wants to see their balance, wants to send a transaction, to have to second guess um, uh, their decision. Also, uh, we are trying to move more uh, features into that wallet. Um, recently, if you use a Trezor, you might have noticed that there is a new tab, uh, Exchanges, which allows you to use uh, several um, crypto to crypto exchanges to uh, conveniently switch or trade between cryptocurrencies. So there's, there's you know, uh, uh, always been a lot of conversations about, you know, what's needed for mainstream adoption and how do we make uh, digital money friendly for your mom or for your grandma? What are the biggest barriers to uh, improving the wallet interface to make it grandma ready, in your opinion? Uh, well, I, it's definitely uh, a move towards uh, picking the right defaults and the right choices for, for the users, which is, it's not always clear, like, for example, f uh, doing uh, fee management, uh, uh, it's it's not really clear whether by, you want to per satoshi <laughs> exactly whether, whether you want it like to confirm really fast or or you don't have a high time preference uh, but we definitely don't see like in the future people like choosing manually their fee this is something that that works more for for power users right now but we we want the wallet to to be able to pick the best choice for you uh, similarly with with lightning network what lightning network uh, brings us is is very, uh, very fast clearing, so, so the payment, the transaction uh, settles uh, instantaneously uh, most of the time, uh, but you need to build a lot of infrastructure to, for that to work well, so that channels are, are open and closed and, and money is distributed uh, in the right amounts, in the right places, uh, and to get there, it, it takes a, a lot of work to make that work very seamlessly for for many users. Interesting topic because I want to take a little step back in history with respect to user experience and how it gets adopted and changed. Looking back at the Apple IIe, it was the first successful computer by Apple. It had an, a case you could open, you could upgrade RAM, you could plug in cards, floppy disk. Um, it was a very expandable computer. Steve Jobs hated it. Users, power users loved it. 
they loved having that control. They loved being able to flip switches, change things. When the Mac came out, those exact lovers of the Apple IIe hated it. Those power users were the people you would go to to learn how to use a computer. They would teach you how to put a disk in and type a command on the screen to launch a program. They became almost pointless. The power of the power user was reduced. And they didn't have as much utility in the ecosystem. I think, I hate to say this, but power users are actually being a detriment to the user experience of crypto. I get into this conversation a lot. A lot of power users say, how can I turn, change this? Enable me to do that. Enable me, enable me to import a mnemonic. Enable me to change the mining fees manually in every way, shape, and form. And realize that even though you're asking for just an option, hey, just make it an option. Realize that every option you ask for is something that a developer in a company or a project has to test with every release to make sure they don't break. And those hours that we're spending testing the options for the power user are hours that we can't spend building better UX for grandma. It's so debt the Mac by became, a thousand features. Exactly. You know, it's, it's technical debt. And when we come out with something that effectively is for what you would call the grandma, sorry grandma to kind of put you at that level, <laughs> but when we come out with something like that, it actually alienates a lot of the power users. Um, one of the things that we do at Edge is we hide the mnemonic. It's there, you can grab it, there's an option to grab it, but we hide it behind encrypting that key with credentials and automatically backing it up, and that freaks out the total power users because they're the ones that hold the meetups that tell people, okay, here's how you back up your wallet, and here's where you write it down, here's where you should put it. So realize that the next time you come across technology that as a power user actually alienates you, but ask yourself, is it one that alienates grandma or is this is actually something that's gonna help drive the adoption at the expense of me, the power user, not having all the power that I used to have? I have to actually agree with this because uh, we have a lot of power users that ask for advanced features from us like coin selection and other things. Um, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We decided not to implement it because Thank exactly you. we are trying to make the user interface um, ready and um, friendly for a grandma, right? Um, for, for power users, there are different applications. You can use the Trezor Electrum, and when it comes to making Trezor Wallet more convenient and usable for uh, non-technical people, uh, right now we are trying to more streamline um, uh, the UI to make sure that people don't click misclick. Um, the Trezor Model T has a graphical inter better, more colorful uh, graphical interface that um, has a visual feedback for people. And uh, now I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so let's let's uh, talk a little bit about the security of the wallet of the future as well. On the last panel, Peter mentioned that Satoshi Labs was uh, using Shamir secret sharing as a way to um, to uh, kind of solve some of the UX around the backing up the, the seed for your wallet. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys envision that right. looking like? Right. Um, so uh, if you're a Trezor user now, or if you're a hardware wallet user in general, or maybe even um, other wallets, um, when you initialize a device, you get a BIP39, um, a 12 to 24 word seed phrase. Um, this is ultimately the master key uh, that, uh, from which all the child keys are derived. It also means that this is the one weak link. You have to be very careful about making sure um, to keep it safely and properly. Um, generally, when people try to divide it, they only split in a half and put one half somewhere and the other half somewhere else, and they don't realize that they will need both of those, these parts. Uh, it's two out of two, essentially. Um, so uh, one, one gets lost, you lose the entire uh, master key. Um, we are working on a, a improvement on top of the BIP39 uh, seed uh, backup, and that is based on the Shamir secret sharing, uh, where you can make a two out of three, uh, meaning uh, you can divide your seed into three parts, and then cryptographically you only need two parts uh, to reconstruct the entire ma master key. Uh, this eliminates the, um, or makes it less serious, uh, the uh, single weak link of the backup process. 
That is a definite huge improvement because that's one of the biggest issues. I've heard the story that Elena had mentioned here on stage earlier about someone putting their seed in bad places. A good friend of mine had lost you know, nearly all of his crypto from putting his seed as a backup in a bad location. But going forward, I think that's an incrementally great, you know, good improvement. But we need to just get the hell rid of those seeds. I can't stand them. And if you think about humankind and how we evolve, having a physical backup of something of money is something that, generally speaking, the trend is an older generation is very accustomed to. You had a safe, maybe you're a gold bug. You've got a house where you're very stationary. That's something, that's something in a demographic that can accomplish this physical security. If you look at what the next generation of humanity looks like, it's much more transient. People that travel a lot, they live out of a suitcase. They want to live and experience different parts of the world. It's an experiential generation. Telling them that they need to take two of three pieces of paper of seeds, put them somewhere in different places that they'll have to recover in case they lose a keychain is still a pretty challenging thing for kind of the next model, the next generation of, of humankind. So. I predict that the future of crypto and the future of security will not require us to deal with a lot of physicality. It will be a model of multi-sig, such as what cost is building, and custodians that aren't full custodians. I can't stand full custodians, but partial custodians. This is effectively what the, the legacy financial system is going to turn into. Instead of them holding and controlling our money 100%, they become nothing more than a cosigner and leveraging multi-sig with co-signers that are both either institutional or family and friends. That I feel like is a definite future of, of crypto and security. And more than that, a way that we can really drive some adoption and make security nearly invisible. That's been our goal is just don't try to make the absolute best security against an attacker, but one that the user screws up. Build security where it's invisible, much like HTTPS. You get encrypted security on the, on the web and you don't even know it. That, I think, is what we should be striving for, where you don't even know you're getting it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very much aligned with, with that vision. Uh, at Moon, because we are, we are two out of two uh, co-signer wallet, uh, we make two promises. One is that Moon will not ever be able to uh, use your phone or spend your funds uh, because we don't hold uh, one of your keys and also that we won't be able to freeze your funds uh, should we ever uh, become uncooperative. You always have full control over, over your keys. And we've also been working on easy recovery options for, for people. So whether you forget your password or you forget something else, th th there's always a way uh, using two factors, so if you forget your pass password, you can use a recovery code plus uh, an email validation to get back your, your funds. Or uh, if you forget your, your code but you have your, pass your password, you can still access your phone. So, so there's always a way of, of getting back your funds, uh, and we are looking for other ways in, in which we can improve this. If I, may, if I may react just to that, I, I think uh, at least for those people who want full, uh, who don't want custodianship, who want to take care of their own private keys, um, I think uh, the seed phrase, or in some form, either Shamir Secret or in the, the current form, is here to stay. Of course, we understand that um, there are better ways how to do it, and that's why we are working on uh, multi-sig too, uh, uh, making it easier, or but yeah, making it easier in the Trezor wallet interface to use multi-sig. Let's talk a little bit about interoperability of, of wallets of the future. You know, today, um, interoperability is, is pretty limited. As Federico mentioned, we're kind of at the, at the IP address stage where uh, wallets are interacting directly through public keys and there's some standardization around uh, monomic and uh, XPUB keys. Uh, what do you guys think are the, the next places where we get more standardization and interoperability between different wallets? Yeah, um, we're definitely seeing like this uh, gradient from like very, very cold wallets to uh, warm wallets and uh, making it really easy to move your funds from, 
from one step, step in the gradient to another uh, is, is going to be uh, one of the most important things in the future. And so we, we, we're very, very excited about this, the thing we, we've been working on for the past few months uh, very closely with, with Tresor. And this is something that, that we will announce today. Um, so as of today, you will be able to pair your Trezor wallet with Moon uh, with a very easy process. Uh, it works just like WhatsApp web with your computer. So you don't need any kind of special cable. Uh, you just plug your, your wallet into the computer, you pair it with your phone, and then you have easy options for moving funds to your Trezor wallet uh, without even touching the Trezor and also a very easy process for withdrawing funds from your Trezor. Uh, so we're very, very happy to, to be able to announce this at LabitConf. Thank you. So, so Tyler, you mentioned, I think, the, the thing about the mnemonics and, and public keys. And I think from the viewpoint of inner wallet operability, the only thing that kind of connects users together at kind of the user level is that public address. And that's been the kind of bane of a lot of people's existence. It's like, oh, god damn, this, this public address. So um, many projects have attempted to resolve this and try and introduce names into the ecosystem, saying being able to pay to a name, pay to a handle. And while the technology is there, we can register names on a blockchain, I think the biggest challenge has been how do you, how do you actually get adoption of that standard? Like Namecoin tried, right. um, there's the ETH, Ether DNS type uh, style, um, and all of them being very blockchain specific have had trouble with adoption. I'm actually really excited about a new protocol that just got announced this, this month, I believe, with FIO. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't already checked out, check out the FIO protocol. One of the biggest reasons why they have a good chance for success is they went straight to the industry first and tried to get adoption from some of the biggest wallet players in the world. And they already have founder member buy-in from blockchain.info, MyCrypto, Edge, um, Coinomi, Shapeshift, and I think a couple others. So some pretty big names in the space. So they did a really great job on the biz dev. The technology, I think, you know, it's, it's not that challenging, but the biz dev, I think, is the biggest challenge. And so from the viewpoint of interoperability, this will let you very inexpensively register either a domain or a name, pay to a name on a domain, such as a paul.edge, and also send requests for payment. So normally when we you know, want to send a request for payment, we send it over SMS or email, you hope the address doesn't get changed. Well, now you'll be able to use this kind of specialized channel blockchain to send a request. As well, you'll, as well, you'd be able to put metadata on a payment. So when I send a payment to somebody, I can put what it's for onto this blockchain, it gets received on the other end, and it's encrypted end to end. Both the request for payment and the metadata of a payment gets encrypted end to end. And so I'm pretty excited about the protocol. I'm excited about the, the people that are working on it. There's very established VCs and previous entrepreneurs that are working on this. And the fact that they already have buy-in from a lot of major names means that when it goes live, you'll already have you know, six of some of the most popular wallets already implementing it, available for you to actually create a name and spend to a name. And, and when do you think we can expect to see uh, FIO in action? Um, uh, hard to precisely say. They definitely know 2019 is a big target. So I'm, I think testnet within the first couple of quarters and probably full mainnet within the next couple of quarters and you know, thir third and fourth quarter of 2019. Hopefully all of it accelerates faster. Awesome. Well, as we're um, running out of time here, I want to move in and talk about a, a subject that doesn't get a lot of attention usually, and that's really around the business models of, of wallets. You know, we kind of all take for granted today that wallets should be open source and they should be free to use and they're, uh, you know, just a piece of software. But what do you guys think the business model for a, a successful wallet of, of the future looks like? Well, um, currently the business model of Trezor is quite evident. We have hardware, so we sell hardware. Um, but there's a limitation to that too, because uh, at one point the market is going to be saturated. Um, a Trezor or a hardware wallet is not a cell phone, so it's not going to become outdated in two years. You don't need to buy another one. Um, they last actually pretty long. Um, so uh, the sales might um, decrease eventually. 
Also, uh, we've seen it, probably everybody in the industry has seen it, that the uh, sales is uh, directly correlated to uh, the Bitcoin price, to the cryptocurrency mood in general. Um, so that's something that you would want to um, avoid too. Um, so uh, we are thinking about a few new models. Uh, one of them is a premium support uh, for um, corporations, for large-scale enterprise uh, players that needs an immediate response for uh, support help whenever they need it. Um, they might be, it's like, it's similar to the Red Hat model uh, that they use. Uh, another one is bundling new um, premium features into uh, new features that will be gonna be supported in the Trezor wallet and more advanced ones. So a lot of people do feel like, oh, the entire ecosystem, within the entire ecosystem, value is being captured pretty much at the exchange level. Right, those are some of the biggest companies in the world in crypto, and because a lot of people want to exchange, and there's a transaction fee you can apply on every exchange, so those are the biggest names. I, th I feel that once we start transitioning into a utility world, and people are actually using crypto, the value capture starts to really transition into the wallets, because we'll still need exchange services, but one of the benefits of the business model of a wallet is by being pure software, we don't deal with a lot of the regulatory and compliance and the regional challenges of exchanges, but we can integrate with them. We're effectively the browser for crypto to access various services. And so as that type of a model, we can actually scale globally much easier than a financial service can scale globally. So I imagine a world where you'll have some of the five, six biggest wallets in the world. Those will be the brand names that you know. They'll interface with the exchanges for those services, and they, those could be almost white labeled or, or not, but effectively they'll be the ones that choose which of these services you access because you'll need the wallet anyway for your utility. That's what you're seeing, that's what you interface with every day. But when you need to do that occasional change or swap, or even if you want to trade, that's going to be an interface that's built into your, into your wallet for either trading um, or for just acquiring and shifting whenever you need to. So that is a business model because we can, all, we can obviously rev share that with the exchanges and we effectively get to decide you know, what regions we support and support much more than any one exchange could. So at Moon, we're, we're betting really big on Lightning Network. Uh, so once this, this infrastructure is built, uh, what would happen is uh, your wallet would connect uh, by default to one of our nodes and Moon would be able to make money out of uh, Lightning Network fees. Uh, one of the cool things that, that we're doing with this model is that uh, in order to ensure a very good user experience for, for end users, you cannot have this like Russian roulette where either you pay an on-chain fee for your coffee and you're paying like 25, 30 cents, or you're paying a lightning fee of let's say one cent or less than one cent. Uh, so. Uh, in order to do that, we, we subsidize the fees for all on-chain transactions. So that aligns incentives really well between uh, our, ours as, as wallet developers and our users. Uh, the more efficient we are with channel management, the more efficient we are able to allocate the money and route payments, uh, the more the end users gain and the more money that we make. Uh, if we're inefficient with this, uh, we lose more money. Uh, but uh, we're also definitely ex exploring other options, like being resellers for hardware wallets. So once you reach a certain amount, uh, we offer you to uh, upgrade to uh, some, uh, move some of your funds to a hardware wallet. And that goes along to uh, a vision of you know holding hands with the user and walking them through the whole process and making uh, them learn and and learn uh, very good security practices and as a final point is is of course premium support which is aligned with this and and we have talked with many people and and the thing they say is you know please help me because like every time I take my hard wallet or or I make a transaction you know sweat is going down my, <laughs> my uh, I'm thinking like this is the time this is the time I'm gonna lose all my funds I'm gonna fuck this up uh, so having very very good support there is is essential to to enable mass user adoption. All right, well, unfortunately, that's uh, all we have time for. I'm sure everyone's ready for lunch, but let's give our panelists a round of applause.